Hi folks, I'm going to give you just a minute to start officially at 11.30. I'm a couple minutes early. I'm doing the Instagram live takeover for Lisa this week. She needs a little time off to do some other things. My name's Dave Dowling. I'm a ball color link sales rep. Um, I had a flower farm in Maryland for 20 years and now I sell flower supplies to people, cut flower supplies, and I also do the online class with Lisa, the bulbs, perennials, woodies, and more. When we get started and you wanna ask a question, if you look at the bottom of your screen, um, I think it's just the second icon from the right, there's a little circle with a question mark in it. You'll type your question in there, and then I can go ahead and read those questions and answer them once some questions are in there. If you put anything in the comments, those will just be comments back and forth between the different people listening. I won't necessarily have time to get to those, so please put any questions in the question bubble, which is the little uh, question bubble with a question mark in it at the bottom right of your screen. Again, my name is Dave Dowling. I'm a ball color link sales rep, selling cut flower supplies to people all across the US. Uh, ball does sell in Canada and other countries too. Um, I just don't, I'm not the sales rep for those uh, areas of the world. And I'm not necessarily the sales rep assigned to every account that's a cut flower account because there's too many of you out there. Um, if you're assigned to the color link office or some other sales rep, you can always ask me questions about cut flowers but I ask that you send everything else to either the color link office or your sales rep, questions about orders, pricing, availability, all that kind of stuff, send to them. But I can always answer your cut flower questions. Again, my name's Dave Dowling. I had a cut flower farm in Maryland for about 20 years. And when I stopped doing the cut flower farm, I went to work for Edney Flower Bulbs, which is up in New Jersey, selling basically lilies and tulips and perennials and things like that to customers. And then the Fred C. Glockner Company bought Edney about five years ago. So I worked for Glockner and Edney. And then I was able to sell seeds and bulbs and other things, uh, liners, to cut flower customers. I've always dealt with just cut flower customers, not bedding plant people. And then about a year and a half ago, uh, the owner of Glockner wanted to retire. So he sold his business to Ball Seed. And Ball Seed has a, div a division called Colorlink, which is the office that works with the smaller customers. And then I'm a sales rep for the Color Link office and work exclusively with cut flower growers. Um, I also do the online class with Lisa, um, bulbs, perennials, woodies, and more, which we're in the middle of that right now. We're in week three of six weeks. The class runs every year in July. Sign up is usually in early to mid June, but it's only offered once a year. So I see some questions. Let's see what we got on here. Ah, uh, Thig Pen Farms wants to know, what is the best way to start lavender seeds? Um, actually, lavender seed, you can start them, but it's going to take you about a year to get those plants compared to growing them from uh, liners or plugs that you would buy or even cuttings that were, you would root yourself. But the lavender seeds, you, they get sown slightly under the surface, the typical 70 degree temperature for germination, but it's going to take them a while to grow. And literally, if you start a lavender seed, March 1st, you're going to have a plant that's maybe an inch tall by the end of June and early July. So for lavender, you're much better off getting rooted liners or rooted cuttings, you would call them. Um, and they're not that expensive. They're less than a dollar each. The only thing is they're usually in trays of at least 50, sometimes 100 or 150 per variety. But I definitely recommend doing lavender from liners or cuttings, um, or you would call them plugs, rather than actually from seed. Um, Bella Renfields wants to know what are some good fillers that I recommend for zone 6A, annuals and perennials. My favorite filler is uh, eucalyptus, eucalyptus silver drop, but unfortunately the silver drop seed has not been available for a couple years because of the wildfires in Australia where the seeds come from. Um, they're expecting to have some seed available again next summer, but not until like August. 
So we're looking all the way to the year 2024 before you can get new plants of the silver drop eucalyptus, unless somebody somewhere might have some, you know, a stash of seeds hidden somewhere that we don't know about. But we can't get the seed to sell it to the plug producers, so the plug producers won't have silver drop uh, eucalyptus plugs even in 2023. It'll be 2024 before they're available again. There are other eucalyptus. Um, Baby blue is one that should be available for next year's plugs or seed. Although if you know eucalyptus, it's just like lisianthus. It takes 12 weeks to get a plant that's about a half an inch tall. So you're much better buying uh, liners or plugs for the eucalyptus. Um, other fillers, um, I love gooseneck blue strife, which is this machia clethroides. It blooms in mid to late June, but it's just a great filler for any time you make a mixed bouquets. Status is great. Just the annual status works great for filling a bouquet. And you have the different colors. You got the bright yellows, the blues, the purple, and even some apricot colors. So you'll have all different color ranges for status, and they all work great. Um, perennial fillers. Um, actually, we'll go with some of the woodies, things like nine bark. It's a nice, either a burgundy color leaf or sometimes a coppery, uh, coppery brown color leaf. It's a shrub. Uh, Physocarpus is the name of it, the Latin name, but most commonly called nine bark. It's a great filler for bouquets. It's very bug resistant. There's very few insects that bother it. So in other words, it'll grow all summer and the leaves are good to pick in late June and still again in September because the leaves are still nice looking. It is a plant that you would prune down every year in the winter. So you get nice new tall growth every summer. But that's a great filler is the nine bark. Then there's also the basils, uh, lemon basil. There's a variety of basil called African blue basil that works really well. Um, so there's just a few of the uh, fillers you could use, but there's lots of other ones options, but there's, those are a few really good ones. But the eucalyptus is my favorite. Even if it's not the um, silver drop, any of the other varieties are great. Uh, red pepper gardens is the first year trialing stuff. Um, can't figure out when to harvest the locia and have plumes, but that don't drop seeds. Um, if you're doing the plume, those are the ones that are almost like a feather duster. So those don't usually drop that many seeds. Um, you pick them when the, the flower head is formed and the size you want. Um, if you're doing the crested slosha or the brain or the coxcomb, those often will have seeds that are formed when you do harvest the flower. Um, all you can do is look at it and see that the flower is the size you want and the seeds aren't starting to open up yet. Um, the other option is if you've got the crested ones, just to rub your fingers on and rub the seeds out. Um, and those seeds you can usually replant the following year and grow something. It might, might not always be the exact same variety that you collect the seed from, but I was yesterday at an Amish farm in Pennsylvania and they had probably a quarter acre of uh, celosia, mostly crested, where it's just a mix and they save their own seeds, but some of the colors in that mix are not available to buy individually. They're great corals and salmons and strange, shade, not strange, but shades of pink, uh, many different shades of red, um, it was just something that you can save those seeds, they cross pollinate, so it's not always going to come true to what you had. But this farmer just has an amazing collection of crested celosia just by saving her own seeds. Um, the other little hint I want to tell you about celosias if you take and look at a celosia flower, whether it's the crested or the plume, and look right under the flower, and if you see a lot of leaves that are really close together, that means that flower is going to still grow and get taller. So if you look farther down the stem, you might see that the leaves are two inches apart. And then right under the flower, you might have six leaves that are almost stacked right on top of each, right on top of each other. That stem is still going to elongate and get taller, and the flower is going to get bigger. Um, so if you see a lot of leaves right under the flower, that usually means that they're not quite ready to pick yet because they're still going to get some more height to them. <clears throat> uh, Nancy Joan with soil blocking. Do you need to cover fresh sown seeds with humidity dome or plastic wrap? It all depends on where you have them. Um, I don't think Lisa does humidity domes on hers, but she has them in a grow room that's got high humidity so they don't dry out. If you were growing out on an open bench in a greenhouse, it's gonna dry out pretty quick. But soil blocking, the idea is you can always, usually check the water on those once a day in the morning and water them so the soil always stays damp. But again, it's, a lot depends on the humidity in the room and your airflow, if you have a really windy, um, windy area and high temperatures, it's going to dry out on the top faster. But I would do a humidity dome before I do the plastic wrap. Often the plastic wrap actually lays on the soil and then it's just not good to have it touch those um, 
surface sown seeds. Um, but if you want to use a humidity dome, you can, but also you want to make sure if you have them growing in a sun spot, like going in a, uh, a greenhouse, that you're not making a little mini greenhouse and then cooking, you know, cooking them and getting too hot. But if you're growing under lights, you shouldn't need a humidity dome. Um, Thig Pen Farms wants to know organic solutions for vine borers and zucchini and squash. Um, what people do is when you have young plants, you go out and wrap aluminum foil around the stems because they do it right at the base of the plant. They can't get through the foil, so they can't get in and lay their eggs and chew up your stems of the zucchini. I know all my zucchini, I was gone for eight days and I came back and they're all dead. The, uh, the vine borders and the beetles got them. But I don't know of anything organic unless you were to spray like a neem or an oil right on the, uh, the insects before they lay their eggs in the stems. Ah, Sunflower, Sunflower Sky Farm has a great question. Can I briefly to, briefly explain how do you light, how do you do the night interruption lighting for sunflowers in the field? Well, the idea with the night interruption for sunflowers is so that they see two short nights instead of the um, long night that they get later in the season. You would not need to do this for plants that are growing in probably April, May, June, July, August, and even early September. If you're trying to grow plants later in the season or really early in the season, either in the tunnel or the field, because the plants have the longer nights and short days, a lot of the varieties, even though they might be labeled as um, day length neutral, are gonna want to try and bloom either shorter stems and also smaller flowers. So the idea is you do a, a night interruption lighting at midnight to 1 a.m. And that way the plant sees the short nights and they think they're getting long days so they grow taller and have bigger flowers. If it's early in the fall season, in other words, you're planting sunflowers in early August or to mid-August, you can do the night interruption lighting in the plug trays for the two to two and a half or three weeks before they go out in the field. If you want to do it out in the field, you need to run string lights just like you would see at a Christmas tree farm or a Christmas tree stand where it's just a 100 watt, law, 100 watt bulbs hanging on a string above the plants. It's not enough lights to, for them to grow. It's just lights to interrupt the nighttime. Um, but you only need to do that if you have stuff trying to get them to bloom much later in the season, like in late September and October. Or if you're, um, well, you're talking about growing in the field, but if you're trying to grow sunflowers in a greenhouse in the winter. Um, if you don't want to do the lighting, you definitely want to pick the varieties that are listed as day length neutral. Um, and that will be a little helpful. But if you plant the same variety June 1st and the same variety August 15th, the finished product is going to be different. Um, the ones planted on August 15th, the flowers are going to be smaller. So that's all the questions I see right now. Does anybody else have any questions? Add them down under the little uh, question mark, although there are more. I wasn't scrolling far enough. Hang on a second. Um, Casablanca Flower Farm wants to know when's the best time to harvest Lysianthus or remove the first bloom. You want to harvest when the second row of flowers start to open. You can either deadhead that first bloom or leave it on there, but it's most likely going to go bad just as the next section of flowers uh, start to bloom on that stem. So you want to harvest them. I always like to harvest when you have two or three of those next set of blooms open. That center first bloom, I would usually deadhead it, or you can take it and use it as just a little short, you know, juice glass sized flower. Any advice on dealing with tarnished plant bugs and dahlias? Um, there are growers who put the little mesh bags over them. It's kind of like the same little mesh bag that people use for wedding favors. And they tie one around every flower when it's still a bug, bud stage. Um, but if you're not going to, uh, other than using something like a neem oil that you spray and actually make contact with the insect, there's not much you can use unless you use a chemical to, uh, insecticide. Uh, Creekside Growers wants to know, do callas need a dormant period? They're finishing up now and they want to try to get Valentine's Day and they're planning to use ProGib. ProGib is gibberellic acid, which all new calla bulbs are treated with that. And what that does is cause them to have more flower stems. Untreated bulbs may only have two or three flowers. If it gets treated with the ProGib, you might have eight or nine flowers per, per bulb. Um, they do need a dormant period. If yours are finishing up just now, I would keep them uh, watered and take care of them until the flowers or the leaves die back. Store them someplace in the 50 to 60 degree range 
If you're growing in crates, they can stay in the crates. You have to dig them, just store them in cardboard boxes. Be gentle with collars. You never want to, you never divide them and you never want to scratch them and do any damage to the skin. If you want them for Valentine's Day, you want to plan on getting them growing again about 10 weeks before Valentine's Day. So in mid-December, you want to get them growing again in a warm space. They like to be 70 degrees to start growing again. It can be a little cooler once they're up and growing, but they need that 70 degrees to really wake them up. Um, so you'd want to start them growing again in early December to have them ready for Valentine's Day. Um, Aquita Flowers wants to know, can you grow Orlea in the field in the fall? Yes, you can fall plant it as an overwintered hardy annual or a cool flower. Um, I think it's if you zone six and warmer. If you're colder than that, you want to plant them in late spring. But Orlea can be overwintered as a cool season flower. If you're thinking of growing it to harvest in the fall, I'm not sure. I don't think that would work. Um, I'm not sure if you can plant a new crop, say in July, to have fresh flowers in the fall. I've never tried that. But because it is an early bloomer in the spring and usually likes cooler weather, I don't think that would work. Uh, gray cut flowers wants to know, could I recommend long stem bulbs to flower April in zone 7B? I'm guessing they're thinking long stem tulip bulbs. My thing with tulips is always pick something that's at least 16 inches tall. Um, better, bet, better yet, pick something that's 18 inches or 20 inches or taller. There's a lot of tulips out there that list as the 14 or even 12 inches that are offered as cut flowers, but people grow those and then they get disappointed because they're only 14 inches tall, but that's what you bought was a 14 inch tall tulip. So you buy the tall ones and then you'll, they'll bloom tall. Uh, blue pen meadow flower. Uh, Lisa puts burlap over her soil blocks to keep them moisture instead of humidity dumps. That's right. I remember that now Lisa does put burlap because the burlap is never going to heat up and it is enough to keep the soil moist. But again, if it's a surface zone soil like a snapdragon, you want to be careful that whatever you're putting over it doesn't disrupt and move around that seed and get stuck to that burlap. And then you pull it out and the seed is gone because it's on the burlap. Uh, Slab Town Petal Pickers. Uh, planted Veronica last fall, finished up a second flush just recently. Will they have another one this fall? Um, yes. If it's a reblooming perennial like Veronica, it'll keep trying to bloom. So as long as you keep picking those flowers, it'll keep trying to bloom. And it will be tall next year. Um, usually if it was planted last fall, they should have been full size this year and they'll still be a tall again next year. Sometimes you get a perennial that you plant a new one in the spring, whether it's from bare root or liners. The first year, they may not be quite as tall as they'll be in future years. But if the Veronica was planted last year, they should have been full size this year and they should still be full size next year. When saving seeds in the freezer, can the desiccant be reused? And can the unused thawed seeds be refrozen? Um, you can reuse the desiccant, although it, they do get a point where it's soaked up all the moisture it can, and then it's not gonna do any good anymore. Um, and can unused thawed seeds be refrozen? They can, but sometimes that freezing and thawing and freezing and thaw is not the best thing for them. Um, one thing you always wanna be careful is, especially if you're starting seeds in working in a greenhouse, you don't wanna take that whole pack of seeds or your whole box of seeds and sit them on the greenhouse bench while you're sowing all the seeds. You wanna keep your unplanted seeds out of the sun and don't let them get hot. And another important thing, if you have seeds in the freezer or refrigerator and bring them out, they're gonna be cold and just like a glass of iced tea, they're gonna get condensation on them when you open them up. So it's not a good idea to take a, a bag or a package of seeds that are cold, open them up in a really humid area, whether it's the greenhouse or your grow room and have them get condensation on them because they're gonna to stick together. And if you don't use them all and don't plant them all, they're gonna be damp and you put them away. So. What is the best way to support store flower support netting. Um, yeah, that can be tricky because I don't know if you know, support netting is very difficult to break. So if you were to walk over it and trip, you're gonna fall. I actually had a, a customer, I told him don't walk down this aisle. She walked down there anyway and she broke her nose when she fell. Um, so you definitely wanna get it picked up and put out of the way. Um, some people just ball it up. Um, I used to have a piece of two by, two by two at the end of each bed to hold the netting and we would just roll it up and wrap it up that, that like a piece of carpet on a roller on the big tube. Um, one other thing I wanna recommend is if you're using support netting on your farm, try and have all your beds the same length. So you don't have to try and find, okay, which piece of netting fits on this 40 foot bed. Um, you keep pulling out the ones that are only 30 feet long. 
If all your beds are always 50 feet long or 100 feet or some number that's always the same, you don't have to try and find the right drip tape or the right netting to fit that bed. Um, I do know some people have taken the uh, support netting and just shoved it and uh, packed it into the big like lawn trash bags. Um, any way you want to do it works, um, but you want to make sure it's not going to get tangled up. So that's why if you can roll it up on something, whether it's a piece of 2 by 2 or 2 by 4 or something like that, it's much better than just bundling it up and putting it in a corner of the barn. Inexpensive, quick-growing foliages. Um, the woody shrubs that are used as foliage, most of those will grow a three-foot stem every year. Uh, the nine bark, um, smoke bush, they grow big. Um, eucalyptus will grow. It's not fast-growing, but if you plant it in April or May, you're going to be able to harvest it in August and September. Um, in any of the basils, they're fast-growing. Um, the lemon basil, things like that. But there's nothing that's going to be faster than like at least eight or ten weeks. Um, same like flowers. If people think, oh, I need flowers in three weeks, what can I plant? Well, you should have thought two months ago and thought about what you can plant because there's nothing that grows that fast. Um, John's asking, when harvesting, if it says to cut at the base of the stem, does that mean partway down where another stem is forming, partway down or all the way to the ground? Um, it depends on the crop. Something like an allium, it's not going to rebloom, so you can cut it off right at the ground and you're not going to hurt the plant because you're not cutting any leaves with an allium. Um, but something like a zinnia or a snapdragon that you might want to have it branch out and bloom again, you don't want to pick that all the way to the ground. You want to leave at least a few leaves at the base so it has a, um, a place for a new sprout to come out and for it to flush out a new batch of flowers. So it's hard to say, you know, cut at the base or cut two inches up because every variety is a little bit different. But a general rule, if you want it to grow out and bloom again, you leave a little short stump with two to four leaves so it'll grow out two to four more stems. Um, Trad wants to know if there's anywhere to get Ruscus. Ruscus is a tough one. Um, if you send me an email, I can check later and see if Ball carries it or any of our suppliers do. Um, that's the uh, usually Italian Ruscus, the green filler. It's just one of those things that it's not easy to find as a plant. Uh, Blair House Blooms wants to know what's the minimum dormancy period for ranunculus before we can force them for re-sprouting. Zone 5 in Massachusetts, they grew them in the spring outdoors, but I want to try and force them inside the basement in the winter. That'll be fine. Normally, ranunculus, it's going to grow and it goes dormant when the soil temperature gets above 60, which means it's going to stop growing usually in late May or early June. They'll start sprouting in the fall again in October, if you leave it in the ground in your field, or in the uh, ground bed in a tunnel or greenhouse, as soon as the soil cools off, it'll start to grow. So three or four months from June to October, I guess that's about four, four months, that's plenty enough time to uh, grow the ranunculus again. Oh, creatively, Candace, oh, here we go. Um, Candace is in zone 6B. Do you think in that don't have a greenhouse, only hoops and covers, should I start my ranunculus in the fall or very early spring? Or is it critical they get established and weather is still warm? Um, ranunculus, you don't want it when it's still warm because the soil needs to be at least 60 degrees or colder for them to grow. So even if you were to pre-sprout them and try and plant them in a tunnel that's still, you know, a warm sunny days and the soil's 65 or 70, they're not going to grow. They're just going to struggle and think it's time to go dormant again. Um... But if you're going in hoops and cover in zone 6B, if you've got a, a caterpillar tunnel, you can plant them in the fall. Um, not just row cover laying on the bed, but if you have a caterpillar tunnel, you could grow the ranunculus in a um, caterpillar tunnel planted outside in zone 6B. Much colder than that, you want to wait and plant them in really late winter, which is usually, I like to say, get them out and growing by March 1st, which means you've pre-soaked them in late January, have them sprouted and growing, and then you plant them out around March 1st into a tunnel up in the colder areas. Uh, Jenny Love, if you search Love and Fresh Flowers Ranunculus Hoops, she has a um, blog post she did three or four years ago that has a lot of good information about growing in low tunnels, anemones and ranunculus. Uh, Rewild Flower Farm wants to know how to manage perennials after the harvest. Do they get a hard chop and regrow foliage or should we fertilize them, divide them, etc.? 
Every perennial is different. That's what makes them difficult. Um, something like the Monarda is going to bloom once. No matter what you do, you can't make it bloom a second time. Um, and you should never chop the foliage hard is what you say here. Um, they don't get a hard trim because they need those that foliage to regenerate the root for next year. There are some uh, perennials that will rebloom. Things like phlox reblooms. Um, I think of some other things that rebloom off the top of my head. But things like yarrow, um, the cottage yarrow, that will sometimes rebloom in the fall. The yellow hard stemmed yarrow does not rebloom again, so it's a one time pick. But every perennial is a little bit different, so it's hard to say, um, you know, cut them all back or don't cut them back. Um, things like uh, gooseneck loose drive, when you pick that, it'll branch out and put out new leaves, but it's not going to make new flowers. So it'll have flowers once a year. And should you fertilize them? Yes, you should definitely fertilize perennials because you have them in there forever, you know, for many, many years. And I like to say they've grown the roots out two feet. They've eaten everything they can reach and you need to give them more food. So don't count on perennials being good year after year if you don't give them some kind of fertilizer, whether it's a really good thick, heavy coat or heavy layer of compost or, you know, commercial fertilizer or fish emulsion, organic fertilizer, just give them something. And then as far as dividing perennials, that's another tough one. You know, things like peonies never needed to be divided. Um, most perennials, you can let them keep growing if you're doing cut flowers and not divide them unless you want to make more plants. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head that you have to divide. <clears throat> when would be the safest time to start fall planting in zone 9B in New Orleans? If you're thinking fall planting as in the cold, cool season, um, cool flowers, the hardy annuals, you want to do it around your, uh, a few weeks before you last, your first frost date. So if your first frost date in New Orleans might be December 1st, come about four weeks and start planting then, so in early November. Um, but if you're talking about fall planting, like a perennial liner that's just going to grow a little bit in the fall for next year, you can start planting perennials in pretty much any zone now in August, September, and October. Um, I wouldn't do October in the really cold zones like zone seven and colder, but August and September is a great time to plant perennial liners. Okay. I don't see any other questions right now that are new. So I'm going to erase any that I see. Oh, somebody here saying the peony leaves are already turning brown and crispy from the heat. Have I lost the plants? No, you haven't lost the plants, but um, August, late July and August is when those plants are putting out new or forming the new eyes for next year. So you, your plants are suffering. It's really important to still water your peonies in the summer. Um, one other thing to point out is the one variety that I can know of, um, Coral Charm. It always dies back early. I get calls every year in early September because my, my Coral Charm are dying. It's just what that variety does. It goes dormant earlier than the rest. Um, with your peonies that are turning brown and crispy, I still make sure they have water. Um, I would never plant anything in my fields that I could not water. So in other words, you should have irrigation or, or some kind of water that you can get out there and water those peonies. Even if they are brown and crispy, still water them because you don't want the roots to dry out too. Um, Denise wants to know, when would I propagate peonies in zone 6B um, by propagate peonies, I'm thinking you mean divide them. You want to divide them when they're dormant. So you can do it after your first frost in the fall or very early spring, um, like late February, or early March, before they start to grow. Um, and that's the way you propagate peonies is by dividing them. Although I always said is if you have a peony that you think you need to divide, dividing it's going to uh, reduce your, your production for the next couple of years. You're better off buying new plants and get all the flowers off of those. So in other words, you have a peony that's putting out 20 flowers. Don't divide that and lose all your flowers for the next two years. Don't divide it and use those 20 plants, those 20 flowers, sell those and buy new plants so you can have more plants growing. Is Salvia Victoria Blue a worthwhile cut? It can be okay. Um, it's more of a bouquet flower, a mixed bouquet as opposed to a selling by the single stem. It does work and you pick it when the flower is actually pretty tall and big. It doesn't have to be... Um, you don't want it to be bloomed out because the salvia has another little kind of flower or floret that comes out of the flower. Um, but yeah, you could pick those when it's big enough. Um, 
my garden blooms bought the I can't say it the Blotodus, Blotodus, the kind of fuzzy plant that was from, um, I forget who the seed company, it's from Australia, it's kind of a little fuzzy, like a little cotton tail, or rabbit tail thing, planted in February, six months later, it's only six inches tall, been pinching the small blooms in zone 7B, um, should I overwinter it, it's not a perennial, it's an annual, I know we sell the seed, and the um, Benary seed company pushes it as a cut flower, but I've never seen anybody yet that grew it that looked like the ones that they show as samples. So um, I think it's a good marketing on their part, but I don't really like it as a cut flower because I've never had it grow well. I tried it and I've never seen anybody else that does really well with it. But it will not overwinter. It's a tender annual. Um, somebody in Phoenix wants to over summer the ranunculus corns. Um, you can do that if you grow something with very small roots over it. So in other words, if you have ranunculus in the beds, grow zinnias or celosia, definitely not uh, sunflowers. And then when you're finished with those, you don't want to pull those old zinnias or celosias up. You want to cut them off so you don't disturb the soil. Um, they say they got no rain, so this should have been watering. No, you don't need to water the ranunculus that are dormant in the soil for the summer. They don't mind being dry. Um, the only reason you would water is if you tried to grow something else over it, like the zinnias or the celosia. Um, but the ranunculus will start to grow again in usually late September, early October. Then you want to give them a good watering in mid-September. It'll rehydrate the roots and they'll start to grow. Um, any suggestions for voles? You know, stray cats, hungry cats is what you need. There is also a product called Mole Max that's made from the, uh, I can't think of the name of the plant, castor bean plant. And that can be helpful for moles and voles. So you can get some of that. And voles are just like rabbits. They multiply like crazy. You need to get rid of them because they will take over. Uh, can, should peonies be planted before your first fall frost or can they be planted after? You can plant them anytime once your soil is cool. The worst thing you want to do is take a peony that's been dug, put it back in the field, and have it start to grow in, in uh, mid-September. So you can plant them at your frost or soon after. You don't, it's not recommended to plant them once it's really cold, like in December or January, but if you know, you've got a really good price on someone's sale, go ahead and do it. But plant them around your first frost date, which most places anytime from early October to mid-November, that's fine to plant peonies. But the most important thing is keep them watered. It doesn't keep the questions in order, so this is weird the way they come up. Um, I don't see any questions right now, and we're already at 12 o'clock, so that went by really fast. Um, I don't see any more questions I can do right now. We're supposed to do this for half an hour, so I think we're done. Um, I'll be back again on three weeks from today, doing the Instagram takeover again at 1130 Eastern Time. Like I said, I am a um, ball color link sales rep. If anybody does not have a ball account and you want to get some, get one set up, just call the color link office. The phone number is 800-686-7380. And if uh, you're interested in my class for next year, you can find information about that at the gardenersworkshop.com webpage. And until three weeks from now, I'll see you again then. Um, other people are taking over Lisa's class Instagram for the next two weeks. Um, so they'll see you then.